Shalom, Ephraimites. This is another Cradle of Hope um, Austin Fellowship teaching. My name is Jared, and I haven't done this. I was telling the group I haven't done this in a couple weeks, so I'm trying to get everything situated and make sure I've got everything together that I want to say. Quick, quick couple of announcements. Um, again, this is the Cradle of Hope Ministry. It's under the direction of Prophet Tom Deckard, and we only teach prophets material, which would be no different from today. Um, we want, we want, I want to really start calling out for some of you people that are new, that are visitors. Um, you know, if you really want to get involved with this ministry, and I, I, I hear a lot of uh, feedback from you guys that you do, you really need to consider coming to these quarterly meetings that we have um, here in Fairfield, Illinois. Um, I know that's difficult for some of you that are outside the U.S., and we'll, at some point we'll figure out a solution for that. But for those that are in the U.S. or have the ability to come, um, the next quarterly is going to be April, I believe, the 24th, 25th, and 26th. Um, I'll have some information in the description below so you can actually get to it. But if you've got questions on how to get there, what type of hotels they have, you know, what things may cost, um, what to expect, um, just send me a quick email to scripturalmaturity at gmail.com. I'll have that email in the description as well. And I really want to encourage you to come and, and really find out you know what's going on, what God is doing with this movement, and uh, see the works of the, the works of God being performed um, in the name of Yeshua, because you will experience that as well. So I wanted to call that out. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to start with Passover, and I want to preface what we're going to do today with this statement: If you are a, the type of person that um, is afraid to look different or afraid to go against what the majority or mainstream is doing, um, then this really isn't for you. Uh, you know, what we're going to learn as we go through this series is that there's the traditions of man that's over here, and then there's what God and his word actually said that we as his children should do. And so when you're talking about the, the topic of Easter versus Passover, Nowhere in the scripture, and I challenge you to go look at this, and I do this every year. I challenge you to go and get your Bibles, get your concordances, and you find any Christian, any Hebrew, any uh, observant believer in the Lord God of Israel keeping Easter. You will not find it. You won't find it. It's not there. Um, but you will find time and time again, no matter whether it's the front of the book or the back of the book, God's people keeping Easter. So what I'm going to do, we're going to get to this scripture probably in part two or part three, but I want to call this out now so I can get your mind right uh, as we go through this lesson. This is what I was looking at before I started. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You can turn there if you want to, uh, but I'll probably put it up on the, on the video screen once I go back and edit this. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to read verse 7 and 8. Now keep in mind, this is New Testament. This is post-Yeshua uh, raising and going into heaven um, and people having the ability to have eternal life. And this is the Apostle Paul that is saying this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Christ our Passover, not Christ our Easter. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hmm. What feast? Passover. Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This is Paul talking to the church in Corinth, telling them that they should keep the feast of Passover. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is, um, how do I want to do this? Let's do this first. So let me screen share with you guys. i got a lot going on over here, so bear with me. Hopefully you guys can see this. This year, 2015, everybody has a choice. And I was, I was asking my wife this a few minutes before I started this lesson. This year, Passover and Easter is the same weekend, okay? And you're going to have a choice to make. You're either going to follow the word and you're going to keep Passover, which starts Friday night on April 3rd, all right? And it goes a week, and we'll talk about this in the lesson. But Friday night, April 3rd, starts Passover. And also, Good Friday and Easter is going to be that weekend as well. So when I started this and I said, if you're the type of person that doesn't feel comfortable going against what everybody else is doing, this ain't for you. You probably should go on to another video and another ministry. But for those people that are willing and wanting to be obedient to what God has said in his word and have no problem with 
keeping Passover because that's what the word says do no matter what your mom your grandma and everybody else that goes in on on Resurrection Sunday does hey man this is what you need to be listening to so what we're going to do is we're going to start out I know I got a lot of intro going on here but this is important all right we're talking about the festival of Passover now we're approaching the time of year and I'm getting into a lesson now um, where we celebrate the death and the resurrection of our Lord Yeshua Jesus this is the time of year we've chosen to celebrate that. Now, Easter has, and this is a fact, has nothing to do with the death and resurrection of our Lord. In fact, 2,000 years before Yeshua, Jesus Christ, was ever born into this world, there was a time called Easter that was kept by the pagans in Babylon. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to throw up another image here, <clears throat> and I'm going to give you a little bit of brief history so you understand. Come on now. You understand where this comes from. So you should see the image that's up there. That is actually the goddess name Easter. Now the name Easter actually comes from Ishtar, also pronounced as Easter, who was worshipped as the moon goddess, the goddess of spring and fertility, and the queen of heaven. She is known by so many other names in other countries and other cultures that she is often referred to as the goddess of a thousand names. Now millions of people are unknowingly reverencing or worshiping and praying to this pagan goddess today um, whose present name is Easter. Now, let me go to the next image. <clears throat> if I can. Hold on. All right. Let me see if I can blow this up for you so you can see it as I read. All right, that should be good. Now, the Babylonians celebrated the day of Easter as they returned or they returned the goddess, the god of spring the rebirth or reincarnation of nature and the goddess of nature. Babylonian legend says that each year a huge egg would fall from heaven and would land in an area around the Euphrates River. In her yearly rebirth, Easter would break out of this egg, and if those celebrating this occasion happened to find that egg, Easter would bestow a blessing upon that person. Now, obviously, you know that that's where the Easter egg hunt comes from. And you need to understand, and it's sad that, uh, you know, more of our children know more about Easter, know more about the bunny, know more about the Easter egg hunting than they actually do about Passover and what transpired even before Jesus died and was resurrected. And that's what we're going to get into today. So we, we you know, the church just decided to follow Easter, which comes after the full moon. Um and they also call it Resurrection Sunday because a lot of people are finding out that Easter is not scriptural um, and that Resurrection Sunday is something that they concoct. There's nothing wrong with celebrating the death and resurrection of our Lord, but in no way is Resurrection Sunday a substitute for what God commanded his children to keep forever. Now, you'll agree that we shouldn't diminish something like that with an occultic holiday. We talk about the same thing with Halloween. Um, but this is where that decision comes in, especially with this year. You and your family are going to have to make a choice, and all we're trying to do is present to you uh, scriptural evidence, scriptural proof, and then you will take that and you will decide whether you're going to go God's way with Passover or you're going to go with what man made up uh, and has been passed down through paganism and what, what we call Easter. So we're going to start out in Genesis chapter 3. That was the intro. We're going to spend a few minutes on this today, not too long. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. So I'll give you a few seconds to get there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. And that says, um, Unto Adam and also to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. You need to understand that when they sinned in the garden, that sin had to be covered. So God had an animal killed, and he made, whether it be, I don't know, you know, draws or jackets, I don't know what they had, but somehow God covered their nakedness, which was a representation of them um, and their sin. All right, so there has to be, we're, we're building a theme here as we go through the word, that sin has to be covered. Um, go to Genesis chapter 22, please. All right, so God had the first animal killed, not for the the the... the reason of eating, but 
he had that first animal killed because that sin needed to be covered. There needed to be something that was going to take the substitute or be a covering for the transgression of man. All right, we sin daily, as I said when we were praying and before I started the video, and we need to ask that our sins be forgiven and be covered by what Yeshua did, and we'll get to that. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and give thee into the land of Moriah and offer him for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I shall tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave wood for the burnt offering, rose up, and went into the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. So understand. We're building themes. We're building a foundation for what we're going to get to later. When was the Lord resurrected? On the third day. All right, so you'll see that as well. Verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. So, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid the wood upon Isaac his son. The wooden cross was laid upon Yeshua as he went to be sacrificed as well. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and, and they wolf, and went both of them together. Verse 7, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. That's Abraham speaking in faith. Because he didn't physically see that lamb that he was speaking of, but he knew the promise that God had gave him that he was going to be the father of, of a nation, of many children. So he knew Isaac couldn't die that day. Uh, where was I at? Verse 9. And they came to the place which God told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, and Abraham took the ram and offered him upon a burnt offering in the stead of his son. All right, that's that sacrifice. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, and as it is said this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So God provided that sacrifice. And we see that that lamb or that ram was being used for a substitute, for a sacrifice, for a covering. So what God was doing back then was setting up a plan that was going to affect us even today. Now, go to Exodus chapter 12. Now, we know, now, coming from Abraham, his descendants became um, the slaves that we know that were in Egypt. So you got Abraham, you got his son Isaac that we just read about, and even Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, and out of those 12 sons, we know was the nation of Israel. And so they went into Egypt after some time. They became slaves, and now we're fast-forwarding to the time where God will bring forth a man named Moses to liberate the descendants of Abraham from Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, the month, this month is called Nisan. Um, it's usually around April. Um, so I believe when this next new moon happens, probably in two weeks, that is going to start this beginning of months of the year, the first month, okay? So again, God's setting down the calendar here. Speak unto the, uh, this is verse 3, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, you shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor take unto his house, take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall you make account for the lamb. So on the tenth day of this first month, God said, 
every family is going to take a lamb and you're going to pick it out and that is what you're going to have for this time that we're going to read as Passover. All right, you got a big family, you need to get you, you know, a big lamb or a couple lambs, but everybody's going to have enough to eat. That's what we're getting at. So this time is speaking of Passover, which literally means to pass over. You should know that story. If you don't, we'll get to it. But we know that Moses went to Pharaoh and told him that all of the firstborn would die, um, and God made provision for his people, being the Israelites, during this time called Passover. Now, God sent several plagues. We all know that, um, like darkness and hail and so on and so forth. But God did not let those plagues, this is important for even the time that we're in now, he kept those plagues from falling upon Goshen. Now, if you remember back, Egypt was where the Egyptians lived, obviously, but there was this little town outside called Goshen, which is where the Israelite slaves lived. None of those plagues fell upon Goshen. So in this time that we're in now, um, as plagues and as judgments are going to come to this earth, we know scripturally that there's going to be a remnant that's going to be held off to the side, that's going to be protected from the things that are coming. Um, and that's a part of what we're doing with Cradle of Hope and trying to find Ephraimites and the Lost Ten uh, tribes that are on this earth. But we'll get to that on another time and another day. But just know that Goshen was protected from those plagues. There's divine protection that comes when, um, you know, when people are in play in tune with God and doing what he's commanded them to do. That's why this is important, and this goes as a part of you being divinely protected, all right? Now, verse 5, all right, same chapter. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from out the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of that same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, notice this has to be done in the evening. The sacrifice has to be done in the evening. When was Yeshua nailed to the tree and when he died? He died during the evening. So, we, again, we see these themes being introduced by God in the beginning, and we see that played out time and time again, even when it comes to Yeshua and what he did during Passover in his day. So, again, the, the lamb has to be cooked and killed in the evening, and this was the same thing that happened with Yeshua being the holy lamb. Now, we're fulfilling a plan that God started even when he said, let there be light. Now, we cannot get into heaven without receiving the Holy Lamb of God. And I know you guys understand that. It takes the covering of that blood to have the remission or the forgiveness of your sins. Now, remember, this is attached to Passover. All right, this shows you the importance thereof. God is reintroducing that concept with Moses and the Israelites. Now, verse 7. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So this is telling you exactly how the meal was to be prepared at that time. Now notice they used the blood as a covering for their sin. They did not drink the blood. Cults, satanic organizations drink blood, but it was commanded that we should never do that. Just use that as a covering um, for sin. We use the blood again to, they, to protect them from the angel, the death angel that was sent forth during that time. All right, verse 9, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing remain of, uh, nothing of it remain until morning, and that which remaineth of it Till the morning, you shall burn with fire. Now, what we do, this is traditional, um, just for fun, because I really don't eat lamb any time during the year. During Passover, uh, we'll either try to barbecue it or roast it in the oven or whatever. And whatever we don't eat, we throw that into the pit, light that up. All right, we burn that, you know, just for uh, tradition, just really for fun, because the scripture says so. 11, verse 11, and thus you shall eat it with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, with your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste or eat it quickly. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, this is important. All right, this is the first time Passover is used in the scriptures. And it's said that it's the Lord's Passover. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's not a Jewish Passover. It's not a Hebrew Passover. It's the Lord's Passover. And that's something that you got to know. It's not the Lord's Easter. It's not the Lord's Resurrection Sunday. It's the Lord's Passover. His words, not mine. 
Verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be for you or be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And ye shall, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. We all know Memorial Day. This is going to be something that is going to be remembered. This day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep a feast by an ordinance. How long? Forever. So when I started out and we read in Corinthians that Paul was telling the church in Corinthian in Corinth, let us keep the feast, talking about Passover, he understood that this is something that's going to be kept forever. Paul didn't say let us keep Easter. He didn't say let us observe Resurrection Sunday. He said let us keep the feast. All right. So Passover is something that if you observe the Lord God of Israel. Um, as being, you know, the God that you serve, being that who you um, dedicate your life to, all right, and how you live every day. If that be the case, and I hope so, if you're watching this video, then you got to understand that this is what he told you to do. Not Easter, not Resurrection Sunday, all right? Now, we'll remember Passover forever. God singled out that plague of the firstborn, and, um, and made certain that the priesthood saw to it that the children of Israel always remembered what happened. Every year we do Passover. Now, I forgot to say that, but it's a good call out now. If you, this is called a Haggadah, and so this is actually um, what we use as we do the ceremony on that night of Passover when we eat the lamb and we eat all the other things that we eat, and we remember what God did during this time. This is a booklet that the ministry has, and it also comes with a DVD to show you how that Seder is, uh, is kept, how this ceremony is done. If you're interested, email the office at cradle at jewishprophet.com. I believe this is, yes, $35. And it comes with the DVD, and it comes with the Haggadah booklet, so you can have that. I'll call it out again, but I'm, it slipped my mind in the, in the announcement, so I apologize for that. But again, when we go through... Passover on that evening, we read through how God sent those ten plagues and how on the last plague God passed over those in Goshen because they had that covering of the blood of the Lamb on their doorpost. Okay, Now, um, God do, does not do things for one generation only. He sets it up to where he introduces a concept in that time that he gave it, and he expects the generations afterward to adhere to that and as he builds on that, uh, those concepts in as the generations go on, we call that transition. So when he introduced Passover during this time, this wasn't just something for them at that time. It was something that was going to be kept forever. And we know that because he said that for one. And we see that that theme of Yeshua dying and being risen from the dead during Passover shows that it was still important to God and it is today. Now go to Exodus chapter 22, please. Exodus 22, and I really want to reiterate this to you guys. It's really sad. If you've got children, if you've got young nieces and nephews or just neighbors, kids, whatever the case may be, you go to them and you ask them. They may be, you know, 10 and under. Ask them, what is Easter about? And they'll tell you, you know, it's the hunt, egg hunts. It's the, you know, taking the pictures with the bunnies at the mall. It's all those things, buying the pink and blue Easter dresses and Easter suits. They know all of that. But then ask that child, explain to me what Passover is. And they'll probably just look at you in confusion, like, what are you talking about? And that's sad, because none of that is in the Word. When I started this lesson, I said, if you're the type of person where you're shy about, you know, going against the grain and everybody's looking at you weird. Our neighbors, you know, my wife would tell you, when we first moved here, they used to snicker and laugh and, you know, you guys are eating kosher and you're keeping Passover and doing all these weird feasts. You don't need none of that. And lo and behold, um, my wife's upstairs, so she can't tell me today, but I say about three or four, maybe three months ago, you know, she's talking to them just cordially and they're like, hey, man, do you know that we're, we're part of the Lost Ten Tribes and we need to be keeping the commandments? We're looking back like, where did that come from? All right? You have to be willing where you are right now to step out in faith and say, 
this is what the word says. This is what I'm going to do. I don't care who laughs at me. I don't care who says I'm part of a cult. I don't care because at the end of the day, there's nobody on this video. There's nobody on YouTube that can prove by scripture that Easter is what God wants his people to keep. Can't do it. You do it, I'd give you all the money in my bank account, whatever that may be, because it's not there. You can't fabricate it to be there. All right? So just keep that in mind. Keep that in your heart. All right? Yeah, you're going to look different, but at the end of the day, it's about following what God put in his word, not what man slapped and said, you know, hey, this is what we're going to do because it looks like a good idea, fills up the pews, and puts money in the play. Exodus chapter 22, verse 29. All right? Now we're getting into the offering portion of this. Every festival that God had, there was an offering that was brought. Okay, now we're going to, you know, get into that portion. Exodus 22, 29. Thou shalt not, de to, oh, sorry. Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits and of thy liquors, the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt give unto me. Likewise, thou shalt do with thine oxen, excuse me, with thy sheep, seven days it shall be done with his dam, and on the eighth it shall give it to me. So God was commanding, hey amen, the best of what y'all got, you bring unto me. You bring unto the Levites, because that's who I appointed to receive offerings on my behalf. Go to Exodus chapter 13. Flip back to Exodus 13, verse 11. Checking my time. Exodus 13, 11. Give y'all a few seconds to get there. Wish I had some water. Forgot to get some. Exodus 13, 11 says, And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it to thee. Thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, everything born, and every firstling that cometh of beast that which thou hast, the males shall be the Lord's. And of the, every firstling of ass thou shalt redeem with the lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. All of the firstborn of man among children shall thou redeem. So again, this is God setting aside the, the you know, children that were going to be dedicated unto him, the animals that were going to be dedicated unto him. This is God setting aside that portion for himself. Um, so again, God gave them specific instructions as it pertained to offerings, as it pertained to sacrifices that were needed in order to stay for the, the, the nation to stay in goodwill with him, all right? Again, sin must be punished either by person or by substitute. Lambs, goats, and rams were those substitutes. Now God accepts us only if we've accepted the sacrifice of his holy lamb, that being his son, Yeshua. That's the only way God accepts us. When we go into prayer, you always have to ask that God forgive you of those sins, all right? because of what his son Yeshua did, being a sacrificial lamb and that blood being a covering for your sins. You have to do that before you enter into the, the his presence, the Holy of Holies. That's the only way God has ever accepted anyone is by a sacrifice first for the sin that was committed. All right. Isaiah chapter one, please. Isaiah chapter one, and we're going to read 11 through 19. Isaiah 1, 11 through 19. I'm going to go ahead and read it. You can catch it on the recording. So to uh, verse 11 says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Now this is important. God is telling the prophet Isaiah that, yes, sacrifices are important. Yes, festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths are things that I've commanded. But the key here is your heart has to be in it. You have to have a heart that's willing to to want to work towards righteousness and holiness, all right, and not just do whatever we want to do, keep do the sacrifice, do the festivals, and then go back to doing what we want to do, all right. So this is I want to put that in your mind. So as I go through this, you understand what Isaiah is trying to convey to the people, all right. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and of fat-fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Be, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. Your new moons and your Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. So he can't do away with these things that he's commanded. But if your heart's not in it, he really ain't happy about how you're doing it either. Verse 14, 
Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hated. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Doing stuff you ain't supposed to do. Wash, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. These things we should do. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall, they'll, they shall be as wool. How is that going to happen? The sins of the people were going to be forgiven because God already knew that he had appointed his son to come and die for those sins, for that nation of Israel, and for those that will accept him to be encountered into the nation of Israel. Verse 19, if ye will be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. So you see, they lost perspective of what God was doing and why God gave them these holy feasts and festivals and sacrifices and the commandments that he gave them. This was so that we as a nation, we as his children, would learn to live holy, to live different from these other nations that are on the earth. You know, one of the commandments that God had gave Israel was when you go into these lands, when I give you the power and the ability to go in and take over the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Perizzites and all those people, do not adopt the abominations of those nations. Don't take in the customs of those nations. God went as far as to say, he didn't even, he didn't even want them, you know, marrying into those other nations. All right, that's what got Solomon in trouble because that influence of Easter, of, of Halloween, of the things that, you know, pagans do, that's going to taint Israel. That's going to, you know, entice you to keep things outside of what God was trying to do. And that's what we're doing now. God's trying to restore back the lifestyle that he commanded his children to keep. And so as part of that is, you know, cleansing ourselves, cleansing our minds of the traditions that we've grown up with. And I, I keep using the, the examples of Halloween and, and Easter because, you know, those are the two big, those are two biggies that we've adopted that are nowhere in the word. All right. So we're going to have to be willing to look stupid to other people, look weird to other people, because in your heart you have to know this is what God's commanded me to do. All right, and I'm going to do it. I don't care what anybody else says. If God says do it, that's what I'm going to do. And on the flip side of that, and we'll get to that probably as we go through this series, is that there are blessings attached to the obedience to God's word. All right, ain't nobody getting blessed for Easter, but you will be blessed if you keep Passover and do the things that he said to do. Because the blessings of God are always attached to the obedience to his word. All right. And that's how that works. Isaiah chapter 53, please. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. All right. And, you know, keep in mind that, you know, the Sabbaths and the new moons, you know, our hearts have to be towards God as we do these things. Rebellion is, you know, always is a stench to God. We can't have rebellion in our hearts. We have to be willing and obedient. Isaiah chapter 53. I'm only, we were talking about this last night. Or I was laughing with my parents about it. Isaiah 53 verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And who is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form of comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. We were talking about that last night. You know, these pictures that we see of Yeshua that have been drawn and or painted or in movies, you know, the Bible says that he is not an attractive man. All right, that's what we just read. There is no form of comeliness and there's no beauty that we just should desire of him. All right, and we was talking about that last night, but um, just know that this is talking about the Lord here. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities, our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
all right? Because of the punishment he took, we can be healed by his name. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before the shearers is dumb, he opened not his mouth. He didn't say a word. He took it. And he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Time and time again, we're seeing that he was that substitute. All right. He, there, you know, when we read earlier, let me pick my place and make sure I can come back to it. When we read earlier that God commanded that you take a lamb without blemish, you take the best of what you got. You know, Yeshua, only way he could be that lamb without blemish is because there was no sin in him. He was the only man that walked this earth, obviously being all God and all man, but he was the only person that walked this earth in flesh that never sinned. He was without blemish. So as God laid upon him the transgression and the sin of the nation of Israel and even the world, you know, he took that without saying anything about it. He knew that he had came here to, to be that sacrificial lamb, to be our Passover once and for all. All right. Verse eight, he was taken. I said right. Verse nine. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He made him and he hath put him to grief. And when he shall take or make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. He keeps talking about him bearing the sin of many. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, with the sinners, and bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So all that saying, all oh, time and time again, that the Lord Yeshua being the Holy Lamb of God, willingly accepted sin upon him, and sacrificed his life for each one of us. All right, we know that, but again, it's always good around this time of year to have a full understanding of everything that the Lord went through um, for you and I and for people that even won't accept him before they die. All right, now, the, did the prophet Isaiah understand all that he prophesied here? Probably not, because Yeshua hadn't been born yet, so we couldn't fully understand what he was saying because um, the fulfillment of that had not come. But timing is everything with God. You know, a little baby lamb, they knew scripturally that, that the Messiah, the baby lamb, the holy lamb of God would come, would be born in a town called Bethlehem. And they knew that he was going to be born, you know, or he ended up being born in what's called a sukkah, uh, which is a makeshift dwelling around the festival of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. All right. Go to Matthew chapter one. Go to Matthew chapter one. So, it, you know, God saw it that it was appropriate that that holy lamb would take on the, the sin of the world. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, and we're going to read, we're going to read this again of what, uh, what Yeshua's role was. We're building upon those themes that we started way back in Genesis and Exodus. Matthew 1, 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, this is talking about Mary, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, or Yeshua, because there's no J in the Hebrew, you shall call his name Yeshua, and he shall save his people from their sins. That's what he came here to do. That was prophesied over him even before he was born, that he was going to come here and take away the sins of his people. Um, Israel knew, again, that he would come through Bethlehem, and they knew that he would be revealed from the, the, the Migdal Er Eder, the Migdal, yeah, Migdal Eder, that's how you say it. Basically, this was a tower that they would stand in and they would look down um, at the, the, the sheep and the goats and the rams and they, as they picked out what would be taken for Passover during that time, they would look down from the Migdal Eder and observe the flock as they would be chosen. And so where Yeshua was born in that makeshift dwelling that's known as a sukkah for the Feast of Tabernacles, that was um, visible from that same Migdal Eder. 
So everything that God put in his commandments that, as it could possibly pertain to um, what Yeshua was going to have to do, it's fulfillment after fulfillment of him being that lamb, him being seen from the Migdal Eder, him being without blemish, so on and so forth. All right. So God doesn't do things just for happenstance. He has to fulfill his word because once he says it, it's law. That's it. It's a done deal. He can't change it. So when he said keep the Passover forever, it's done. It's law. Can't change it. Nothing's going to replace it unless God himself comes forward and do that, and he hasn't done that. All right? He said he won't do that because it's going to be observed as a memorial forever. All right, John chapter 1, please. I'll do a couple more scriptures. Actually, this is the last scripture. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And we're going to read verse 29. And then I'll probably close with that other scripture that I began with because it's that important. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus, or Yeshua, coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John the Baptist knew who he was. Yeshua knew who he was. All right, He was the Lamb that was to be sacrificed during the time of Passover, as we will read in the second, third, and fourth part of this series that we're doing. All right, so this sin reverts to the totality of sin rather than many sins. Um, Yeshua would take away all of our sins and would be that covering that we talked about even with Adam and Eve. All right, God intended for Adam to be the end of the matter. He never intended for man to have to die, but because that sin entered, uh, he needed a second Adam, which meant a, meant a new beginning for all of mankind. After three and a half years of Christ's ministry, a crowd of people followed him into the great city. Now, when when a king enters, there's two ways he can do that. All right. So obviously, Yeshua being the king um, over all of Israel, and he will be when he returns. There's two ways a king can enter into a city. They can either enter on a chariot, as they've you know just triumphed over a war that they've won, or a king can enter on a donkey. And if you remember back, um, I believe with Palm Sunday. As Yeshua entered into the city on a donkey, they laid down uh, those palms in reverence to to who he, who he is. All right, they knew that him being that sacrificial lamb. It's funny that those same people that laid down them palms, um, you know, didn't really come to his defense when it was time for him to be sacrificed. But God's word had to be fulfilled. So we're gonna stop there again. Um, you guys really need to. If you do not have this, um, the Passover Haggadah, which is a few pages that walks you through how to do the ceremony on Passover Eve, and also it comes with a DVD, so you know exactly you know what foods to buy, uh, you know what you know the wine, the the different things that go on with this particular ceremony. So I believe the donation amount is thirty five. Email cradle at jewishprophet.com and you can get that. Now I want to end with this scripture that I opened with because it's that important. All right, First Corinthians five eight. Paul told the church to let us keep the feast. Not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Um, so again, April 3rd at sundown, we'll begin the Passover of 2015 for this year. Um, and I you know, encourage you to have the courage to keep um, Passover this year. And we'll talk more about the details of that next year. But you know, do that instead of what the tradition of man is trying to get you to do. So again, this is Cradle of Hope Ministry under the direction of Prophet Tom Deckert. My name is Jared. This is the Austin Fellowship, um, and we'll, we'll return next week talking about Passover again. Shalom.